there's just one thing you can count on an American knowing about U.S. history, in fact many non-Americans as well, it's that George Washington was the first president of the United States. And if there's a second thing, it might be that the nation was founded in 1776, but that leaves an odd 13 year gap between when the United States began and when George Washington was elevated to the highest office in the land. Now, of course, the nation ran during that time. They just ran by different sets of rules, largely under a set of rules called the Articles of the Confederation. And it might surprise you to find out that as early as 1774, there was already a man in the United States who carried the title President, years before George Washington would take the same title. The forgotten first presidents of the United States deserve to be remembered. The First Continental Congress met for 51 days in 1774 in Philadelphia. The Congress had representatives from 12 colonies. Georgia did not participate and ultimately called only for a boycott of British goods and for the intolerable acts to be rescinded. On the opening day, the Congress elected Peyton Randolph, a fairly conservative Virginian and Speaker of the Virginian House of Burgesses, President of the Congress. He fell ill at the end of the Congress and was replaced for his last four days by Henry Middleton of South Carolina. The President of the Congress was a very different position than the Office of the Presidency that we know today. The Continental Congress was a legislative body with no executive or judicial power and the office was made deliberately weak so as to not give any man too much power. The President of Congress actually had less power and responsibility than the speakers of most of the colonial assemblies. The President acted as a neutral moderator of debates, took care of congressional correspondence, although he could only answer letters if instructed to, and sign congressional documents. He had no power to direct the congressional agenda, make committee appointments, or meet privately with foreign leaders. By the time the Second Continental Congress assembled in May of 1775, it found itself in a very different position from the first. No longer were they just arguing with Parliament and the Crown. They were fighting it. The battles of Lexington and Concord had been fought just weeks before, and the Congress was the only national institution that could direct a war effort. Peyton Randolph was again elected president, but he left 14 days later to oversee the House of Burgesses and was replaced with John Hancock. It was unclear if Randolph had actually resigned his position or only taken a leave of absence, which became somewhat awkward when Randolph returned in September. Hancock refused to step down, but the issue was resolved when Randolph died while dining with Thomas Jefferson on October 22, 1775. The Congress quickly established a Continental Army and put George Washington at its head. Hancock remained president of the Congress for two years and 158 days, the longest tenure of any congressional president. He led the Congress while it drafted the Declaration of Independence, and an early copy, the Dunlap Broadside, bore only his signature and that of the Congress's secretary. Hancock requested a leave of absence in October of 1777, which was granted, but the Congress quickly elected Henry Lawrence, father of Washington aide John Lawrence, his replacement. Henry Lawrence signed the first copies of the Articles of Confederation as they were sent out for ratification on November 28th. It took more than three years for the states to ratify the Articles, and during this time the Congress struggled to lead the war effort across the colonies. Before the Articles' ratification, there was no set term for the presidents of the Congress, and they served essentially as long as they liked, and Congress allowed them. Hancock returned to Congress in 1778, but was disappointed that Lawrence had replaced him, and he had hoped to return to the position. Two more presidents served before the Articles were finally ratified. John Jay, an opponent of Lawrence, and Samuel Huntington. Jay went on to become an important founding figure, helping to negotiate the Treaty of Paris, serving as the governor of New York, and being appointed the first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Huntington signed both the Articles of Confederation and the Declaration of Independence, and served as governor of Connecticut until he died in 1796. Huntington was president when the Articles were ratified and signed by the delegates of the last state, Maryland, on March 1, 1781. The Articles specified that presidents of the United States in Congress assembled serve not more than one year in any term of three years. But the transition from the Second Continental Congress to the Confederation Congress was unbroken, so Huntington remained president, though he had already served longer than the term. He resigned a few months later due to poor health, and Congress elected North Carolinian Samuel Johnston. But Johnston declined to serve, and so Congress instead elected Thomas McKeon, then a delegate from Delaware. McKeon was a long patriot who had the odd distinction of being a delegate from Delaware while he was serving as Chief Justice in Pennsylvania. His election was somewhat controversial. Despite the ceremonial character of the presidency, some still thought he was too powerful as both a Chief Justice and a President. 
He served only long enough to reach the new Congress, which convened in November 1781, but was serving when Cornwallis surrendered Yorktown in October. Marylander John Hansen was elected as the first president to serve the official one-year term, took office on November 5th. Hansen disliked the job, so much so that he considered resigning after only a week, citing the irksome qualities of the position, but was convinced to remain because only seven states were then represented, which would have made selecting a replacement difficult. This began a constant issue for the Congress, which was so weak under the Articles that it often struggled to seat enough members to reach a quorum. Of the 50 members that made up the body, an average of about 35 were usually present, and sometimes as few as 22. Some leading men refused appointments to the Congress in favor of remaining in positions in their own states. Hansen played an important role organizing and recruiting soldiers for the Patriot cause, as well as collecting powder, supplies, and generally helping to finance the army. During his time as president, Washington presented Cornwallis' sword to Congress, and the great seal of the United States was first used. When he was elected, Washington sent him a letter that said, I congratulate your excellency on your appointment to fill the most important seat in the United States. He was followed by Elias Boudinot, a New Jersey lawyer who had served as commissary of prisoners under Washington, supplying American POWs and managing captured British. Boudinot signed the Preliminary Articles of Peace in November 1782, which became the basis for the Treaty of Paris, which he signed the following year. He would later serve as the third director of the U.S. Mint. Thomas Mifflin, his successor, served for seven months. He had worked as the Army's Quartermaster General for several years, although he was also involved in a plot to replace Washington with General Horatio Gates. Mifflin found it difficult to convince the states to send enough members to ratify the treaty, which was finally done on January 14, 1784. Mifflin accepted the resignation of General George Washington from the military and also appointed Thomas Jefferson Minister to France. Mifflin resigned in June, and a replacement wasn't elected until the next Congress in November. Richard Henry Lee was president beginning in November of 1784 and spent much of his time trying to realize a plan to sell land from the Northwest Territory, modern Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin, Indiana, Illinois, and part of Minnesota, to pay off the debt brought on by the war. Though he passed the Land Ordinance of 1785, Congress lacked the ability to enforce or collect money from land sales, so the scheme struggled. It did establish the basis for the public land survey system. John Hancock was re-elected president of the Congress in 1785, though he is not actually in the Congress and was in poor enough health that he was unable to perform his duties. Instead, the job was handled by David Ramsey and Nathaniel Gorham, who used the titles of chairman. Gorham took over as president in June of 86 and served a few months. By 1786, the failures of the Articles was becoming glaring to everyone. The individual states could not or would not protect national trade, and merchants were disheartened when the central government could not protect the frontier or the country's borders. John Adams, as minister to England, struggled to negotiate treaties because the states could not act in concert. The Congress printed money was valueless, and they could not levy taxes to support the government. Shays Rebellion in Massachusetts further underlined the absolute inadequacy of the Articles. In September, delegations from five states met in Annapolis and recommended a broader constitutional convention for the following year. It was in this atmosphere that Arthur St. Clair was elected President of the Congress in February 1787, the earliest the Congress could convene with a quorum. Still, it was during St. Clair's term that the Congress enacted the Northwest Ordinance, which officially organized the Northwest Territory, one of the most important acts of Congress under the Articles. St. Clair had been a commander during the war and was later appointed governor of the Northwest Territory. He would later lead an American force to the country's greatest defeat by Native Americans, the Battle of the Wabash. Meanwhile, the Philadelphia Convention outlined what would become the U.S. Constitution. By the time the Congress convened again, the writing was on the wall. It was clear that the Articles of Confederation would not survive, and nor would the Congress. The Constitutional Convention sent the new Constitution to the Congress, which chose to send it along to the states for ratification without comment. The Congress couldn't muster a quorum to elect a successor to St. Clair until January 2nd, 1788, when they elected Cyrus Griffin. Cyrus served with the Congress until November, when he resigned because only two members arrived for the new session. By then, the Constitution had been ratified, although it didn't take force until March 4th, 1789. In some modern assessments, one or another of these men might have been called the real first president of the U.S., especially John Hansen, who served the first full term under the Articles of Confederation. One of the reasons John Hansen is so often cited as the first president is because later descendants pushed for that narrative. In 1898, one descendant wrote a biography that argued he was the forgotten first president and successfully pushed for Hansen's inclusion as one of the two subjects from Maryland in the National Statuary Hall collection. 
though some later historians have said he wasn't a prominent revolutionary figure. A journalist, Seymour Wemyss Smith, wrote John Hansen, Our First President, in 1932, which continued to push the narrative. Historian Ralph Levering says books like those were not by professional historians, and they weren't based on research into primary sources. Another, Richard Morris, says that if any president of the Congress should be called America's first president, a stronger case could be made for Peyton Randolph of Virginia, first president of the First and Second Continental Congress, or for John Hancock, the president of Congress when the body declared its independence. There are other problems with declaring Hansen the first president. He wasn't the first president under the Articles, as Samuel Huntington served under them, and both Samuel Johnston and Thomas McKeon were elected by the Congress before Hansen began his term. The argument for Hansen lies randomly with the fact that he was the first president who served the official one-year term, though later presidents of the Congress often served irregular terms. More importantly, the two positions shared little other than title. The president in Congress assembled was chosen by his colleagues and was little more than ceremonial. Richard Morris argues that the presidents of Congress could with some discretion influence events and formulate the agenda of Congress, though it depended largely upon their own prestige. The position was not executive in nature, it was mostly one of a presiding officer. Another historian wrote that the presidency under the Constitution is scarcely in any sense the successor of the presidents of the old Congress. In all, 14 men served as presidents of the Congress between 1774 and 1789, representing nine of the original 13 states. And most of them did play important roles in the Revolution or after. Their signatures are all over some of the most important foundational documents of the United States. And their frustration with their position represented just how poorly the Articles of Confederation served the needs of the fledgling republic. Each of them was important in their own way in the founding of the United States, and we can still see that today because their names are memorialized in the names of countless counties and towns and schools and bridges. I happen to live in a county that was named after Arthur St. Clair. But it's not so much about any of them individually. Each of them could actually probably warrant their own episode of the history guy. It's about that forgotten position in which they served that represented that odd period between the Declaration of Independence and the ratification of the Constitution, or maybe more importantly between the Treaty of Paris and the ratification of the Constitution, when Americans had to figure out what it was like, what they had to do to actually administer a nation, rather than just fight for one. It also says something about the nature of what it means to be first and how such things can be manipulated for later interests. And while the presidents of the Congress might not have been presidents of the United States in the way that we understand the position today, certainly their contribution deserves to be remembered. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.